Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mihai Karabash, and today I will present you the talk Hot Keeping Horges Running on PBSD and Hypervisor, which is a fancy name for uh, finally being able to run uh, GSOS under this uh, Part of the, the talk was done, also done at HRBSDCon, who was, was there, has seen uh, some part of the talk. Uh, before starting, I want to present, present myself for the guys who uh, do not know me. I have a PhD in virtualization on embedded uh, embedded devices. Part of the PhD is also related to the uh, And at this point, I'm a lecturer in operating systems, system architectures, and networks at the University of Virginia College of uh, My history with BSD. So I started working on BSD systems in 2012 on the Dragonfly BSD. I chose Dragonfly BSD because it is a very, very small community and it was very easy to enter there. I worked on their scheduler to make, to make SMT aware, to know about hyperthreads. And after that, in 2014, I worked on their VKernel, which are something like jails, but uh, a little bit more extended. They are not fully based <coughs> on machines, but something between. And they were doing page table uh, shadowing, which was very slow, and Matthew Dillon uh, had the idea of using Intel EPT future uh, to replace the page shadowing. It turns out that I had to do a lot of virtualization work to use the EPT. He had the idea to use only EPT, not the virtualization extension, and this didn't work at that point. Um, after that, in 2014, I moved to Beehive. Uh, I worked with Neil Natu at Instruction Caching. Uh, this is uh, related to instruction emulation. So Beehive is doing a lot of instruction emulation. And the emulation, uh, it takes a lot of time to complete. And a lot of instructions are repeated. So we came with the idea of, OK, we are doing emulation the first time and uh, retain the result in a hash table, and the next time when it appears, uh, just put the result, not read the emulation itself. Uh, it had not uh, the result we expected at that point, uh, because this is very useful when doing NASP virtualization. And this time currently doesn't support NASP, but the feature isn't much, but it, it is there somewhere. Uh, in 2015, Peter Graham came with the idea of porting the hybrid ARM given the fact that ARM was entering the server market. Uh, I've been working on that from 2015, 17, and uh, 16, sorry, and from 17, uh, other students took my job to, to complete. Uh, in present, I'm coordinating a lot of projects like Save Store from yesterday, uh, Live Migration, and, and also AMD64 uh, presentation we will see after that in the main room. Okay. Uh, other, I also had some people in my master project in my uh, in my university, the ATM emulation code and any 2000 emulation. All of these, unfortunately, are work completed but wasn't weren't merged at that point, so they are on some repository. Uh, this is all about me. So at this point, I'm focusing in promoting and coordinating different projects in my university, given the fact that I do not have so much time to code. Uh, let's go into the presentation today. First of all, I want to give you an insight about what virtualization is and how it was achieved on ARM. Uh, hardware virtualization. Basically, with hardware virtualization, a new CPU GPH level is added. On Intel AMD, it basically extends the current kernel mode and it has a non boot boot mode. And on ARM V7 and V8, a brand new level uh, is added called heap mode. So this is the uh, these are the levels on AMD. We have the monitor mode, and on top of this, this we have the kernel mode for the kilo mode, and for the normal mode we have this new level added. So before this wasn't there. What is the type of hypervisor? The type of hypervisor is the one that leverages uh, the, the current operating system. So for example, take PBSD. 
So we can use all CDA this feature in order to provide support validation. So, uh, for example, if it needs memory management, it won't implement its own memory management methods. It will use CDSD. This is applied to hypervisor. As also this, as a type 1 hypervisor, which implements all it needs. Okay, uh, an example of type 1 is Xen. Okay, so uh, Beehive, um, Hyper V, KVM are type 2 hypervisors. You want the fact that ARM added a new mode, this from the material mode, it is very hard to achieve a type 2 hypervisor because basically you have to rewrite existing parts of the base OS to use the new register because it is a new mode, it has new registers, new instructions, and you cannot access the, the old ones. And even then you cannot run user space applications. Um, because we don't want to write a full hypervisor from scratch, basically we insert the small code, which is a bridge, in hypervisor mode. Okay, so in tip of here we have a very small code, which is called by the killer mode in order to execute uh, what we need instructions on the hardware. Okay, so it's a bridge between the kernel, the CDSD kernel, <coughs> and the hardware virtualization extensions. Uh, other type 2 implementations on ARM is the one from KVM. It was uh, firstly done uh, by the virtual persistent guy, I, I guess five or six years ago. Okay, and it is working. So basically our model is sampled with that one. Okay, let's dive a little into the Beehive. Uh, in Beehive we have multiple uh, level, so we have the user space where we have the beehive executable and the beehive load, which is a logger. It depends on what you are using. These two user space applications are doing system calls to the kernel space. In order to um, to have an uniform way of calling the kernel space, uh, it was created a library, a user space library called libgcpi. <coughs> Which basically exposes some interfaces. Those interfaces, what they are, what are they doing? Are doing IRCTLs to the PMM kernel module. And for ARM, we added this tip mode component, basically running in tip mode. This doesn't exist in behind x86. Um, okay, let's see how we get from behind x86 to behind ARM. Okay. So we have all the modules I presented you earlier. <coughs> we have the kernel module, DMM.KL, DMM API, and also the Beehive, non Beehive, and Beehive CR. Uh, we created a new uh, directory in ARM DMM by copying the DMM interface. So basically, we took uh, each interface from DMM and copied it to ARM, and also uh, git read read, uh, git read of all uh, of the XDC registers. So the interface from AMD64 has, has actually a lot of XDC6 uh, dependent parameters. Okay, uh, and we created a new module called DMM ARM. So this was the first approach. Basically, we added the ARM <coughs> to, to be to be to being able to. Uh, to make a distinction between the DMM and DMMR. DMMR basically is a kernel module which manages the hypervisor state, the context switch between guest and host, and also it manages the guest system memory, so it makes it, it will make this matrix. Further, we have the Libyan API R, uh, with the duplicated basic the library, which is the API for ARM. Behind load ARM. Again, we duplicated the, uh, the interfaces and written the code for ARM there. So again, this is, we only duplicate the interfaces, the code is different. And the Beehive ARM is basically uh, the user space process that runs the type loop and is doing all the emulation we need. Okay, so let's start from, um, from the hardware, from the low level input. First of all, we crafted an init code with native in local. Uh, that, that code basically jumps to a routine where it checks if, if the platform has virtualization extensions available and also install, install uh, a stub vector 
uh, exception, exception vector for heat mount, okay? Because uh, changing the mount from kennel to heat is, do is done to some exception, and for this we need the exception vector. And also we have a variable which we mark, uh, we mark it as true as having available the virtualization extensions. Uh, after this, we create some low-level routine for installing, for setting and getting the exception vector. Because initially, being in the first stage of booting, we didn't know much things about um, the, the hypervisor and about what routines we could use. And this is why we installed the sub one, which is virtual empty. And at this point, we are basically replacing the routines. Uh, and also we find the low-level code that is doing the context switch between the host and the VM, as I was told you, telling you earlier. Basically, a context switch means that we have to update all the registers of the host, restore the registers of the guest, and make the guest running. And when the guest has an exception on the side to exit, we have to save the guest registers, load the host once, and continue the host running. So basically, it's a tight loop of saving and restoring. It is very important to be very accurate because here you can do lots of bugs to crash the host and also the guest. And it is very hard to debug at this point. Um, so, how do we make host OS, how the host OS, which is living in the kernel mode, doing hypervisor calls? Uh, we basically indicate the ABC instruction. The ABC instruction will call an exception and we go to the uh, hypervisor exception vector and we let it go in there. And also we created, uh, let's say, um, a rule where the first part of, H of ABC will be basically the address of the routine to execute in hypervisor mode. And also, very important from the security wise is the kit mode is looking of which virtual machine has done the ABC call. Uh, because we can accept hypervisor calls only from virtual machine zero. If you are um, if you are um, aware of Zen architecture, then you have the zone zero. Still is the same thing with with the host. Host is the first virtual machine we have, which has the ID zero. It's the only one which is able to do these hyper calls. And here I have a schema, so it is not it is not so intelligible. Uh, so you see here we are in the kernel. And we are indicating HBC, HBC instruction with parameter zero, which means the zero is a special, uh, it has a special meaning in our case. Uh, basically, when uh, it will call an interrupt, the interrupt will go in the interrupt vector table, okay, and it will branch at the heap HBC label, okay, and there we have implemented the logic. So this is the workflow, uh, it is done when calling the HBC instruction. Okay, what uh, interfaces we have for the type of type of hypervisor? Um, we have the VMM stub install. It is a very particular function which basically installs a stub exception vector. It's a temporary one until we initialize the the, the beehive module. We have the HP HPC, which does which allocates the internal structure of beehive. Um, and is doing the mappings. Then we have, this is very important, VMM call T. This is the function with, um, which basically calls a service routine from the hypervisor mode. Under the dysfunction, basically we have a HDP call. It, it, it is nothing special. <coughs> we have the VMM set get HD bar. Basically this routine sets and gets the current exception vector. And we have the two functions, keep enter and keep active guest, which basically make, make the context switch, save the guest state, restore the guest state. Okay, so until now, we have the exception vector in place. We have uh, a mean to call the routines. We need memory in order to be able to work with the hypervisor and the guests. Uh, memory mapping, heat mount. Uh, it's basically another other space. So we have the kernel, kernel space, and heap mode is another 
are the address space for which we need mappings. The problem is that, um, that the mappings are special ones, and I'll tell you, tell you about them later. Uh, also, we have a new translation le uh, level called stage two translation for PM isolation. For what we did use this stage, uh, stage two translation? We you know that we have a page table which is translated for virtual address to physical addresses. Um, for the virtual machines, we basically, the virtual machines have their own page tables which are translating for their, basically their, for their virtual to physical. But these physical addresses are some we call intermediate physical addresses. And we have another level, and this is the stage two level, which is managed by the hypervisor. So basically the hypervisor can control which physical addresses can the VM access through this uh, uh, stage translation. Both of these mappings, so the keyboard mappings and the stage translation mapping, uh, has, have a requirement. LPA, uh, large page table uh, address, sorry, large, uh, large physical address extension is called, so LPAE. Uh, support, LPAE, it means that you can map more than 32 bits on, uh, or more than 32 bits on 32 bit architectures. The problem is that PBSD does not support LPAE in RV server, okay? So we cannot leverage on its memory management. We had to implement our own LPA support in the VM code. Okay, uh, we choose to implement the support for the 40-bit physical addresses. Okay, again, please remember we are on a 32-bit machine here. Okay, and we choose the three-level page table support. Other formats are available, so there are multiple configurations. We choose the simplest and the one that can accommodate as much as we can for the instant implementation. An uh, issue here when tracking page tables is that on 42 bits we do not have the DMAP mechanism, direct map. What is the DMAP mechanism? Basically, um, you are able to find the virtual address going from the physical address. So think of it that a thing, think of it at the following case. We are building a page table structure for a translation and we have three level of page tables. The first one, um, the first one will point to the second one, but this pointer is a physical address, okay? And to the third one, which is also a physical address. In order to be able to uh, modify the, these two page tables, which are pointing to, we need their virtual address. We are, we are able to write that the, the physical address, and we do not have anywhere their virtual, original virtual addresses. And this is, this is why we decided to create a shadow page table to retain the same structure, but uh, not the physical addresses, the hardware that MME is using, but the virtual addresses we need to use in order to update the page tables as page posts and so on. And we also need this for level one and level two. Mm. Okay, some memory mapping considerations. We map the hypervisor code at the same address in heap mode and in host OS. Okay, so we have the PBSD, we have the hypervisor. Both of them <laughs> has mappings from the same virtual address to the same physical address. Why? Because when we are doing VMM code heap, we are sending addresses of the function. And this has to be consistent between hypervisor and the um, between the hypervisor <coughs> and the host OS. Okay, here are some uh, graphics with the translations. So we have the hypervisor mode, and we have a stage one translation to the physical address that is done with LPA. And here we have the get operating system, which has its own uh, memory management okay, with a stage one translation to an if IDEA in the physical address, okay? And from here to here, the stage translation is managed by the hypervisor. So the hypervisor will control to what physical addresses has the virtual machine access to. Further, we need uh, emulation for devices. 
<coughs> the emulation is that MMI emulation, sorry for the devices. And we implemented this using stage two traps. Basically, here, we didn't create any mapping. And whenever the guest was accessing the internet physical address, it was causing a fault. That fault uh, came into Beehive, and Beehive knew that that is an MMI emulation fault and just uh, did the implementation of the device. First, we implemented the BDM console. It's a very well, it's a very simple console that was used on MD64 for Vinda and also helped us with debugging and so on. It fault based, so it, it is not so good in terms of performance and usability, but in the boot up, it was very helpful. Okay, so until this point, we have the CPU uh, virtualization, the memory virtualization in place, okay? and we start booting the virtual machine. The virtual machine from this point will boot until it will get to the devices. Let's see what we need for the devices to work. Uh, the guest boots up asynchronously, and in order to interact with it, we need uh, one needs a response to user input, okay? And the responses usually are coming calling based or through an interrupt controller. <coughs> also, guest must respond to user input, and for this, we have to have a mechanism for uh, the virtual machine for the guest to be interrupted in order to be able to check if anything uh, is available from user. And here we use a timer. So we have the interrupt controller, which is not to find the guest. And we need a timer in order to be able to check periodically if we have something for, from other devices or from the user. Further, this, this presentation will cover uh, some uh, aspects about the interrupt controller on, on ARM and about the timer virtualization. So because we don't want to do polling, we'll use a new device called Interrupt Controller. Basically, it acts as a bridge between the peripheral devices and the CPU. Whenever a device wants to send uh, data to the CPU, it will basically talk to the Interrupt Controller, and the Interrupt Controller will notify the CPU. Uh, there are two generic, two generic uh, Interrupt Controllers, let's say. We have the APIC the advanced programmable interrupt controller on XTBX and Intel AMD. And on ARM, we have the generic interrupt controller, also known as G4 GAC. Uh, it's a, basically the system present on ARM processors. It centralizes all the interrupts and provides support for managing them. And also, it's available for different running modes. You see here the virtualization extension. This this particular is interest for us because you'll see that uh, we have some support for virtualizing the interrupt controller. The basic components of a JIC are the distributor, which basically receives uh, the interrupts in order to make uh, to prioritize them and distribute them to different CPU uh, on on the board, and we have the CPU interfaces, which provides priority masking, masking and preemption. Uh, handling from processors. Uh, here is our schema. So we have the GIS distributor, and the GIS distributor basically sends the interrupts to the specific CPU core. But before the CPU core, we have the CPU interface, which, which managing, which is managing these interrupts. Okay. So we have one distributor and a number of CPU interfaces as the number of cores, one for each core. There are two. There are two types of registers for managing the, the JIC. We have the ones that are uh, GICD from the distributor and GICC from the CPU interface. For the distributor, we have registers that enable that allows us to enable or disable forwarding of the interrupts and also clear the present state. For the uh, CPU interfaces, we have the acknowledgement register, where one, one can acknowledge an interrupt, and an, and a, and an interrupt register, which sign on the completion of handling the interrupt. So we have acknowledge and sign on the completion. Um, the interrupt lifecycle, so we have four states. 
active inactive spending and spending and active we have transition one from inactive to spending and two from active to spending and active this uh, so transitions one and two um, are are done when uh, an interrupt is being generated by a collector or a softer. Okay. Further, we have transition three from pending to inactive, or four uh, from pending and active to active, when uh, when the state is removed from <coughs> sorry, the pending state is removed either because the interrupt was deactivated or in case it is level trigger. Or, uh, do, uh, or due to a software modifying the state. Further, we have transition five for edge trigger interrupts and six for level trigger. When we have knowledge from pending to inactive and from pending to pending and active. And seven and eight, whenever we deactivate interrupts. We are coming to finish the state. So these are all the possible, all the possible states, transitions. Sorry, we we'll need to know them when virtualizing the distributor. So in terms of interrupt control virtualization, we have two components to virtualize: distributor and CPU interface. <coughs> uh, I provide the CPU virtual interface which can be used directly by the virtual machine. We basically only have to map the CPU interface on the virtual CPU interface. Actually, the other way around. The virtual CPU interface is on the CPU interface. And we need, uh, this is for, so for CPU interfaces, there is not much to be done, but in terms of distributor, we need to emulate access to each of the distributor uh, configuration registers. In terms of virtualization specific registers, we have the GV uh, interrupt knowledge register and GV and the interrupt register. You see that these two resembles with the register from the CPU interface. Basically, they are the same, but they have the V the, for virtualization there. Okay, and we have two more specific registers. Uh, GICH LR list registers. Basically, this is a, a list which contains all the interrupts that need to be signed, signaled to the CPU. The problem with, with this list is that it's very limited. For example, RV7 on the platform we tested, there, there are only four elements in those registers. This means that we can sign on the CPUs only four interrupts. Okay? And we have to decide which of the interrupts will be there first. So, for example, I followed the implementation of this, and they had some uh, initial implementation in 2014 15 when they were just adding interrupts to the full list, and they ended up two years later with a pretty, uh, pretty serious algorithm to, for doing this because they were, they were missing some interrupts at some point. And the empty list register task, empty list register task registers, it basically lets you know which of the registers are available to deliver interrupts from the ones above. So in order to, <coughs> in order to, um, to have the virtualization expansion for the JIC, we mapped uh, GICCC on GICB, as I told you earlier. And we emulated the access to all GICD registers. So how have we done the how have we done the distributor emulation? We basically register the distribution, the distributor address range uh, for internal emulation. Basically, every access to those to those addresses were faulting and were returning to Beehive, and Beehive knew about this that they had to be emulated. We created some internal structures in the hypervisor to return the state of the distributor, basically the configs for each interrupt. Are to enable active states, conf, so everything related to the distributor. Okay, and according to according to the structures, we need to populate the LR register, LR register, as I told you earlier. 
Um, okay, and to leverage the existing intra logic, the internal state of the GUG was synchronized, the virtual GIC was synchronized whenever we were returning to guess and back. Uh, let's go to the timer. <coughs> Uh, an implementation of the direct timer with virtual disk extension provide us provide us four timers per CPU. So we have the non-secure PL1 uh, physical timer, the secure one, uh, non-secure PL2, PL comes from previous level one and two, so six months ten months, and the virtual timer we use. Here are the registers. Uh, <coughs> Virtual timer control register, an important one. Uh, another important one is the CMTH CPL, which basically controls the access to the physical registers. And the, the last one, CMTVO, is a virtual <coughs> the register which specifies specifies the value to be subtracted for the physical physical counter. In, in order to uh, in order to to have the virtual counter, virtual counter available, sorry. Uh, here's the transition. So when we are doing host initialization, we have the host running. When we want to run the guests, we, are, we will basically store the guest registers. And before the guest will run, uh, we'll basically check the hypervisor internal state to see if the uh, virtual timer so we will check the virtual timer to see in order if we have any drops we should deliver to the virtual machine before running it. Uh, when, uh, when going to state two, basically to the guest running, the hypervisor enables the virtual timer and also disables the access to the physical timers using the registers I was telling you earlier. Uh, uh, further, the guest can run with access to the virtual timer without any any interrupts from from the from beehive. Okay. Uh, also, any any interrupts that are triggered are triggered here are sent to the VGIC, which will inject them accordingly. When exiting ex 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 the guest, <coughs> <coughs> we send the two registers, the CMTV. Uh, and CPL, okay, and the hypervisor internal state is the basis. Okay, we have a transition from four to one, uh, and the host continues to use the physical timer until the guest is entering again. Okay, um, results. Currently, PBSD finishes to boot up uh, the boot up process while running as a guest in Beehive. So you can see here the G zero. The, the G0 then the generic timer. Um, and we see that we are yeah, we are getting to console here. The development platform was uh, fast models, more fast models from ARM using a Cortex K15 emulation. But the problem with this one is that you need a license, but if you want to test it, you can grab it for 60 days, I guess, and you can run it. Uh, behind. Also, we have run with high one on real hardware. We started with Samsung Exynos uh, 5250. Uh, the problem is that in the process of um, in the process of doing debugging, we burned out of uh, this uh, this board, and we couldn't find at this point to buy another one. And we moved to QB2. It's an all new A2 A8, A20, recommended by model at that point. Uh, running behind on a real platform, it was a little bit tricky because we had to do uh, a rebase. So we started uh, with the newest code we had there is was from A2015. Uh, okay, we had to do a rebase with the current hub. We had lots of issues with new uh, new edge additions. So we had that leaf kit problem. Now it's upstream. There is there is no issue. We had the int RNG problem. 
uh, with the VG. Okay, and for example, before coming here, I used another rebase, and I saw that in the RNG we had default, and we had to remove it that from our code base. Um, and again, each rebase takes a lot of time, so it is very complicated to rebase because ARM, it's, uh, <coughs> let's say, ARM or code is very volatile. Another issue we had is with U-boot, because U-boot needs to be, uh, needed to leave <coughs> the board in heat mode state. So by default, uh, in, in order to be able to run PBSD, the board was left in kernel mode, not heat mode. Okay? And the ABC instructions was, uh, was uh, causing unfunding functional exception because we don't know about that instruction. We discovered that uh, Linux was using boot M command, which was leaving the, um, the board in hypervisor mode, but we were using the simple go command, which hasn't, hasn't had the same path as boot M. So we prepared this and we were able to enter heat mode. Other issues were with LDF, LDF um, schema instruction because it needed it need a label which was a 4K relative distance from, the, from where we, we were calling. And also we had to replace LDF with ADF. So these were some internal Issues we had, we had a debug, it was pretty tedious debugging. Uh -huh. But in the end, we were, we managed to, to make this work. Again, these were working on the NY server on the board, they weren't working. Because as the emulator doesn't consider all the, all the real hardware, let's say, aspects. Another issue was with interrupts. So the host interrupts weren't disabled before entering the guest. And in the guest, we were seeing a lot of spurious interrupts. We were thinking that there is a problem with the rigid logic, but the problem is that we didn't disable the host interrupt. And the interrupts that were added to the host were ending up to the guest, and the guest didn't know about them. And again, we had differences between the emulator and the hardware platform. Some tests were not required for the emulator to behave correctly. So the emulator is a subset, let's say, uh, from a hardware perspective. Okay, these were the issues. Uh, ne the next steps. The next steps are merging the code. In order to be able, so we have an open review from 2016 or 17. Uh, the last, so we added all the comments, but the last issue was the fact that Beehive was not designed to be uh, multi-architecture. So it did not have uh, MDN code, machine-dependent, machine-dependent split up. And we basically, what we have done, you see here, we have duplicated the code, the folder. So there, there were different folders, and this is not okay from uh, the structure point of view. What we have done here, it was basically create uh, the folders for ARM and SCBZ, okay, and provide the make files, but at this point it isn't enough. So uh, we are talking with the Beehive community to see what would be the easiest way. So what they want to do is basically uh, move Beehive SCBZ in its own folder and bring down the generic code, but Bringing up generic code is not so trivial because what is the generic code? Okay. You have to have multiple platforms to, to, to see what is the generic code. Because at this point, a lot of interfaces and people interfaces like RUN or XCWM had registers, XCWM registers in them. Uh, other next steps? Um, to test it on more other platforms and maybe uh, also, ARM PC4 platforms. Alex will give the talk uh, later on this. Uh, and also, SMP support in here in our module. At this point, we didn't got properly all the structures in there. Because, in conclusions, ARM is offering us support to create a performance virtualized lab controller and, and timer, sorry. Uh, pretty tedious to emulate each operation of a distributor and debug the timer. We had 
especially on the hardware. And again, it happens about our hardware platform. They have to have a JTAG, the very processor, to see the state of the board. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll answer them. So questions? Yes. It means it means that it does not it does not need user interaction. So while well, using you don't need to do anything. And after you boot it, you need to enter commands, LS and so on. So it's it was a generic uh, command. Yes? So what's your goal for putting this into the tree? What's my goal for? And what what's your plan for getting this into the tree? I just uh, pull up the computer there after the uh, debate for years. So. Yes, I know. Uh, the last thing they commented on is that it would split up. Um, Alex tried to do the split up as they wanted for the other DBM API, which would certainly do with it. Uh, again, it was done uh, from 2018 from November. It's done. And Again, no comment on that. I don't know. Uh, I, I thought so. Uh, actually, this process was very simple because I personally met John Marvin, okay? and I explained him the situation and he better understood this. So the high community has uh, had some change from Peter Graham changing the leadership and so on, and these changes weren't easy. Okay, there were a lot of issues at no, ATV6. They managed to solve them, and at this point, I. Uh, I'm trying to get the high bar. <coughs> Another issue with the high bar is that it doesn't have a real, um, a real um, support from the industry. So they don't have any real other platform of one which you want to run the high bar. Maybe the high bar is too poor. Okay. Um, we started with the high bar at that point because there wasn't any support. Right. And this is another issue because if there will be one for users, one this maybe this, this could be other uh, it could be different, a different situation at this point. another point for which I, I propose, if you'd let me to So, for example, uh, what we have done for Beehive, Beehive, Beehive um, so let's go to Beehive, it's more simple. So, you can see here, in order not, not to copy the folders, we have created a folder for each architecture. Okay, and this is for ARM. ARM and so on, and the make files. Uh, but this format isn't quite accepted by the Beehive community because it just it, it just moves the code to the folder, to the, to the uh, N64 folder. I'm, I don't, I'm negotiating and maybe they will accept this form of just moving the code and provide a make file and it go. Merge the Beehive code, um, code and then create the general, the more generic interface. Okay. Other questions? Yes. How would you describe the the state of it? Can I test this on a QT board or something? QT two. QT two. Yes. Yeah. Two, two, yes. And it's a fast model emulator. And the emulator. Okay. And I propose start with the fast model because it it will make your hand in putting all the things in place. Are you building binaries anywhere? No. Can you? Uh, can we do? I guess so, but at this point we don't have any integration. Yes. Do you have like uh, I know you have some like stuff on Wiki for like saving the room? Like do you have like docs on how to write? Stuff? Yes, have I, I I sure have for the fast model for tutorial somewhere how to download it, how to run it. That would be really I, I have I have to find it. Can Alex? Oh, please. Yeah. 
what PO on the wiki or? 4R? So here, what we have got is perfect. So you can hear the steps, including the virtual devices. So on our GitHub page, GDAD, it has the wiki there. And we have that repository also for GDAD. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, if not, thank you very much for your attention.